Welcome to Oxford, or rather, welcome to Oxford, London, Vienna and Paris. Thanks to this Torch virtual event, you are indeed going to be live with all those cities, and you're going to be live with a series of fascinating guests. This is part of the Humanities Cultural Programme organised by Torch, and we'd conceived of it initially quite differently, but of course, because of pandemic life, we've had to reinvent the event. We've had to reinvent the event in a way which I hope will be entertaining and during which you will learn all sorts of things from our guests. We've called this particular session um, Singing, Playing, Lili Boulanger, Debussy. 1918, of course, was a difficult year for all of Europe and for France in particular. 1918 was also the year in which, within 10 days of each other, two major French composers died. Two very different composers, two composers of different generations, Lili Boulanger, who was only 24, and Debussy. And today we're going to be talking about Lili Boulanger and about Debussy. We're going to be talking about their music, about the texts they set. We're going to be talking about singing these particular composers. We're going to be talking about playing their music. And we're going to be discussing also briefly translating some of the poems which are set to music. And with me today to talk about Debussy and Lili Boulanger, I would like to welcome Anna Sideris, who's our first guest. Anna, welcome. You're in London. Tell us a few words about yourself. Greetings from London and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Anna Sideris. I'm an operatic soprano, but I really enjoy uh, a whole range of French repertoire, including melodie, opera, of course, and operetta as well. So it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you, Anna. And now straight in from Vienna, we have Eloise Bellacon, who is going to join us too, I hope, thanks to the airwaves. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eloise Bellacon. I am a French uh, classical pianist. I live between Paris and Vienna. And I am active as a soloist. I play uh, recitals and concertos with orchestras, but I'm also a chamber musician and sometimes also a singer accompanist. And my first uh, recording was uh, released uh, two years ago, and it features uh, the complete prelude for piano by Claude Debussy. Thank you very much to you, Eloise Bellacon. And our third musician today, is joining us from Paris. I told you we had Paris here too. And you will see Europe is represented also by Daniel Proper. Daniel, welcome. Daniel, can you put your microphone on and we can listen to you? Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Great to have okay. you, welcome. Okay. I'm, I'm from Sweden, Daniel Proper, a classical pianist and accompanist. And uh, I live in France, in Paris. And uh, music brought me here, and especially the music of uh, the Impressionist Claude Debussy. Thank you very much, Daniel. And finally, I would like to bring on Laura Tunbridge, my colleague from music here in Oxford, who's just released um, a book on Beethoven in nine pieces, which many of you will have read or read about. If you haven't read it yet, do. Laura, welcome. It's lovely to have you here. And we're going to start off, I think, by having a quick conversation about Lili Boulanger. Um, I think Lili Boulanger is someone who's better known than she certainly was a few decades ago. And both um, Eloise and Anna, you have had occasion to play or to sing um, Lili Boulanger. And I can see you nodding, Eloise. Could you say a few words about why you think Lili Boulanger is an important composer? I would say um, playing Lili Boulanger works. It's at the same time very demanding and very rewarding. It's not an easy music, it's, it's quite complex and it has its own personal style. Although we can of course uh, clearly feel the influence of, of Debussy, of Gabriel Fauré, who was her teacher, and of sometimes also Richard Wagner. And sometimes it also feels 
also uh, like a kind of mystical experience because she was very often in her vocal works uh, inspired by biblical or mystical texts. And I think you can feel it in her music too. And the famous uh, Russian uh, conductor Igor Markevich say about her, she is the greatest of all women composer of music history and not only in French music. And I found really moving and remarkable to see how much her music is powerful, despite the fact that, that all through her life she had to struggle with illness and uh, she died only age uh, 24, which is very tragic, of course. Thanks, Eloise. And Anna, your experience as a singer, because you've sung several of the melodies by Lily Boulanger, and indeed we have a special performance which we will have right at the end of this particular session, thanks to you and thanks to your friend Dylan Perez. But before that, can you say a few words about singing Lily Boulanger? Uh, absolutely. Boulanger is a, she's a really interesting composer. First, first of all, because of her, the time in which she was writing and but her capacity to write for the voice, given her young age, is incredibly impressive. The vocal lines that she writes are both challenging but very well written for the voice. And the text that she chooses to set is interesting too. This, the cycle Clairière dans le ciel is um, setting the text of Francis Jam. And here we feel her, her treatment of the text is very faithful, I would say. And I choose that word quite purposefully because she had a very strong faith herself as did Jam's. And you can feel that in the way they write, in the way, in the way she sets these songs, they're very, um, faithful, they're very respectful, they're very clear in terms of their subject and for the singer they don't ask you to add a uh, huge virtuosity or or kind of import your personality on top of them, you really need to just be faithful to what she's written. Laura, I can see you nodding, you've had a lot to do with the Oxford Song Network and are interested in the way in which text and music work together, did you want to come in on this? Oh, I was, I've always been struck in her music by the intense beauty of it, but the directness of it, I think, is also really important. And I think that's something you just captured really nicely, Anna, in terms of what you were saying about not needing to do more with it than is, is there, I think, is probably what's always struck me about that cycle. Thank you. And I'm also struck by the fact that um, both Eloise and Anna, you've stated how important the textual inspiration is for Lily Boulanger, whether it's the textual inspiration of what she's actually setting um, in the case, for instance, of um, the Francis Jam uh, poems uh, of Clairière dans le ciel, or indeed more widely biblical texts you mentioned, um, Eloise, uh, earlier on. And um, we might come to this with Debussy later on, the idea of textual inspiration as being central um, to a certain number of composers' music. Um, what I'm struck by also, um, like, like Laura, is this question of um, how the text and the music interact and the idea that, in a sense, the music accompanies the text, that together they form something. Um, and th the music is not sort of serving the text and the text is not serving the music, is what you seem to be saying, Anna, that there is this sort of extraordinary conjunction. Would that be fair? I think... Uh... French vocal writing, particularly around this period, is, is particularly interesting on that point because, you know, if we go to the German leader or, or some of the operatic uh, repertoire, you have something that's very psychologically driven and as a singer, I feel like you have to go very within the character to find what drives and what motivates. In the French repertoire, dare I say this will sound controversial, it's almost it feels much more as an exploration of beauty. And so as the singer, it's not so much going within oneself to find your motivation. It's really using what's on the page and not feeling responsible for expressing everything. The piano plays such a crucial role in highlighting the situation or perhaps the emotions of the character. Uh, it really is such a partnership in that respect. If I can jump in there, I think, rather than talking about this in terms of accompaniment, talking about collaboration. Absolutely. The equality between the parts is really important in this repertoire. I mean, I hope that Eloise and Daniel will agree with me here, but I mean, I was thinking about it in terms of also listening to the piano music. In some ways, in some of the piano pieces, you can imagine a voice being inserted in there rather than feeling as if this is all necessarily singer-centered. Well, um, 
Sorry, please, Eloise, come in. I quite agree, and uh, maybe you just wanted to add that in, ver in this very cycle, Clarière dans le ciel, which, uh, which is quite moving, is that there is a possible identification because, uh, between herself, Lily Boulanger, and the woman described in the poems, uh, which makes it almost like maybe an autobiographical work. Because, um, for example, in the first song of the cycle, there is a phrase, uh, she laughed and moved with the lanky grace of girls who are too tall. And we know that uh, Lily Boulanger was herself very thin and very tall. And this is one of the few examples uh, of this maybe uh, resemblance between the woman of, of the poem and the composer. Thank you. Yes, and we um, maybe also should recollect the fact that this is a, a choice of a cycle of poems um, which Lily Boulanger herself selects. Um, she's setting Francis Jam, who is a near contemporary in a sense, he's, he's writing at that time. Um, and in that respect, the textual inspiration um, ranges all the way from the, the Bible or from um, distant influences to the, the contemporary and texts which are much um, closer to her. Um, so just a point to the audience, um, we're talking and I'm in the very fortunate position of being able to ask questions. Um, you may also ask questions if you wish. Um, you simply need to submit them through the, the YouTube um, chat um, box system. So please do feel free to come in and we will try and um, find uh, ways of, of, of answering them during, the, um, during this particular session. So thank you for these. I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes on one particular um, poem from Clairière dans le ciel, uh, the one which we set uh, as part of the poetry competition, the translation uh, prize, um, Elle était descendue. One of the things which certainly struck me uh, about the poem, and the reason I'm here uh, is because French literature is, is my special subject. Um, what struck me about the poem was it's at once extremely simple and extremely effective. It was one of these, and it, um, I think it, it goes with what you were saying, Anna, earlier on. Um, there's no excess in it. Um, and yet it's very powerful. Um, it's using relatively simple words in a relatively simple way, and yet it's managing to do more than it um, seems to, to, to do. It manages to achieve um, more. It's a, it's a very um, simple, very beautiful, and very moving um, poem. So Anna, you have sung it, Elle était descendue. Can you speak about it as a singer? Um, absolutely. It's really, the style, in a way reminds me a little bit of Debussy in the beginning and that it's quite parlando in a sense. She sets the text in a way that I believe not being a native speaker is very complementary to the French language. It feels very naturalistic in its setting. At the same time, it's technically demanding, but it makes me think of Eloise's point, in fact, of, of it perhaps being a bit autobiographical in when we have the, the, the young girl walking um, with a kind of lanky grace and you have these 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 really high soaring notes you really feel like you're being tested to your limits and then the final um and then it asks for a di very different color i'm just gonna excuse me find her marking in the last um section of the avec melancholie comme dans un souvenir that suddenly is a color that's quite different um so it's a demanding song but never with trying to put too much on the top of it. As you said, it feels quite perfectly formed um, and quite intimate, demanding in range, but also intimate. And as an accompanist, Eloise, what does the piano feel like? Would, would it be the same type of experience for a pianist? I would say it's quite comparable to Debussy. I mean, uh, but the harmonic language is a bit more modern and daring in the in the way she she um, makes the chords uh, each other. I mean, it's it's a bit uh, uh, more more modern language than Debussy, but it's quite similar in the way of composing for piano and technically speaking, pianistically, it's quite similar. Yes. And would you feel that in the same way as um, Anna does that it has this sort of variety, this range within it, whilst being a, a unit? Yes, uh, she spoke of uh, this this part in the in the melody where uh, there is very high notes, and of course it's very demanding for a singer to make high notes pianissimo. I mean the the softest possible, because you cannot control uh, so much 
uh, when you are on high notes. So I think it's, I'm sorry, I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm not so good to, to uh, improvising English. So maybe I, I just pass on this. I would completely agree with what you're saying there, Eloise, completely. It really, in, in a way, in the beginning, it feels it would be easy to almost look at the vocal line as being simplistic, you know, but as we go through, it becomes more and more demanding. And as you say so correctly for a singer, it really extends your range and in, in, in quite an extreme way, but you have to find a way to do that within the simplicity of the song. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, we could we could go on um, because this is so fascinating, but I think because we have a number of people watching us who actually translated the poem and who have therefore tried to see how the language works. And we asked them when we set this poem as a um, translation piece uh, for the competition, we said, try and think about it with the music. So try and produce something which is at once um, a translation of the text, but something um, which could be sung. Um, I will hand over now to our very special guest, um, Her Excellency Madame Catherine Colonna, who is the French ambassador in London, who is going to announce the prize winner, or the prize winners, I should say. And then we will return um, and speak about Debussy. So over to Her Excellency now. Bonjour à tous, je suis Catherine Colonna et je suis l'ambassadrice de France au Royaume-Uni. Je suis très fière de participer à votre cérémonie, même de loin, et très heureuse de pouvoir le faire en français. Mon rôle aujourd'hui est d'annoncer les gagnants, les heureux gagnants, du concours de traduction du poème de Francis James, « Elle était descendue », poème mis en musique par la grande Lily Boulanger. Alors avant tout, je salue et je remercie tous les organisateurs de cette cérémonie, euh, Tanch, Oxford, et la professeure euh, Catriona Sett, bien sûr, mais je salue aussi tous les participants. Bravo d'avoir participé, bravo de vous être euh, exercé à cette très difficile traduction qu'est la traduction de la poésie. Alors, avant de jouer mon rôle et d'annoncer euh, les lauréats, euh, je vais vous dire un petit mot plus personnel sur la poésie. On la pratique euh, trop peu dans nos métiers, euh, trop peu assurément dans le mien. Mais parfois, j'ouvre euh, un livre de poésie. Je réfléchis, je m'évade. C'est une respiration. Et puis, l'autre jour, juste à côté de l'ambassade de France, où a vécu euh, Malarmé, à Brompton Square, j'ai repensé que la poésie faisait du bien au monde. Juste à côté, quelques vers pour réfléchir, pour penser. Bravo donc d'aimer la poésie. Alors maintenant, je vais annoncer les lauréats. Et les lauréats sont dans la catégorie des moins de 18 ans. Premier prix pour un travail vraiment remarquable qui a impressionné tous les juges, Febe Ali. Un second prix est décerné à Elisabeth Ogunde. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Dans la catégorie des plus de 18 ans, le premier prix est décerné à Léo Charlier. Le deuxième prix va à Alexander Dawkins et le troisième prix à Amira Ramdani. Et là aussi, bravo, bravo, bravo. Il y a aussi trois euh, mentions honorables et je veux les citer. Pour Douglas Thornton Le Perse, Taïba Suleiman et Sarah Wright. Voilà. Bravo à tous, encore plus aux lauréats, mais pas seulement aux, aux lauréats. Nous sommes euh, ravis de voir que ce poème de Francis James et cette euh, belle musique de Lily Boulanger vous a inspiré, a inspiré autant de participants. Et bien sûr, bien au-delà de moi, toute la France vous salue, vous remercie et encourage euh, le plus grand nombre euh, possible à aimer la poésie française, à aimer la musique française, 
à tisser nos liens. Nous sommes deux partenaires incontournables, voisins, amis, et nous le resterons. Je vous souhaite une très belle cérémonie et vous adresse toutes mes félicitations. Bravo. So congratulations indeed to all the winners and we will be in touch about your prizes. Um, that was a rather wonderful way, I think, of saluting your efforts. Now, we mentioned Debussy already. I'm going to bring um, Eloise and um, Daniel into the conversation with Laura now, um, because Eloise, you mentioned uh, Debussy as a writer um, for the piano, and you recently recorded Debussy's complete prélude. So could you say a few words about playing the prélude first, please? Yes, I think um, it's fair, a very interesting cycle, cycle for many um, reasons. One of the very interesting thing about it is that uh, Debussy, for the first time, didn't um, place the titles of each prelude uh, at the beginning of the piece, um, like you should do normally, but at the very end, after the last bar, and in brackets, exactly like it were uh, a postscript. And uh, it means that the titles are only suggested. And the, the French pianist Alfred Cortot um, explained that Debussy wishes that the pleasure of the audience or of the reader should be to guess the emotion that Debussy is describing in music and the fact of verifying if the sensation was guessed right should create for this audience an intimate fulfillment. And it, it is of course a very um, interesting phenomenon and a very, uh, uh, a very new approach at this time. And uh, yes. And uh, what's also, also uh, quite fascinating uh, about this, uh, cycle of very short piece, two uh, until seven minutes for most of them, uh, is uh, Debussy once said that if someone doesn't have enough money to travel, he should uh, compensate with his own imagination. And uh, we could probably say it's exactly what he's doing uh, in the two books of the prelude. He's inviting the audience to a sort of travel in space and a travel in, in time. He's taking us to ancient Greece, to Italy, to Spain, to, uh, of course, England, uh, America, antique in India, ancient Egypt, and of course, to France um, with a, a quote of the Marseillaise. And uh, yeah. So you mean Debussy is the perfect lockdown composer? We can't exactly. travel. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like their postcards being sent. As uh... yes, that's, a, that's a nice idea. Yes, postcards from ancient Greece or postcards yeah. from <laughs> Egypt. And, yeah. um, and Daniel, your experience as a pianist of playing Debussy, um, does Debussy in a sense verify the emotions which um, he's trying to project? Yes. Like, uh, well, what I think fascinating uh, with playing with cycle is to observe also um, the fact that his uh, composition style is really evaluating uh, within the cycle. Uh, for the first book, which was composed uh, 1909, until the second book, 1912 or 13, his music is really becoming uh, more abstract, and some some pieces are even. Uh, strange and enigmatic. It's we can really say it's a work of maturity. Uh, exactly. Uh, actually, it's a quite the same time he composed his uh, unique ballet, which is called um, Jeu. That's um, uh, plays. And this ballet was a commission of the Ballet Russe of Sergei Diaghilev. And uh, we can we could compare this uh, prelude to uh, prose poem. Uh, where he really liberates himself from the uh, form uh, of um, of the sorry of the traditional form rules, and that's Pierre Boulez who tried to explain uh, the modernity in uh, in um, Debussy uh, form. He say that Debussy's uh, ideal objective was really to preserve the illusion, and he didn't want that the audience could guess. The how it's made, and he wanted that everything in his music seemed ordered by a very mysterious rule that we will never know. 
And Daniel, what about you, your experience as a pianist playing Debussy? You said Debussy attracted you to Paris, in a sense. Well, I think Eloise has said a lot, uh, a lot of uh, right things. And uh, uh, Debussy was and became a visionary. And it's, it's really fascinating to see in, in the progression of the preludes from the first, very first pieces in the first book and, and the last in, in the second set of uh, the modernism. But on the same time, there's a, there's a sort of tribute to, to historic preludes and of course Bach and, and Chopin. And, and uh, as uh, you may know, uh, one of Debussy's first piano teachers was a student herself of Chopin. Chopin. So, um, um, and, and, and I think it's very important to stress that uh, in comparison to the romantic composers, he was really global. Debussy was really global in taking this Japonisme uh, and all these influences from other continents and not just uh, Europe. Um, playing, I, I think uh, I haven't played the all set and I, I'm very impressed by Eloise uh, playing in this, uh, it's a marathon and, uh, and, and, uh, and it's a technical and psychological, very demanding. And uh, I, I just have a question about this, this famous uh, afterthought, the title of putting afterwards. Uh, I, it's, it's very curious, very interesting, but it only works once. Uh, once you know when we all have them, the titles are set in the programs. We never put uh, uh, put on a, a concert with the preludes of 24 without noting the and then guests. So it's 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 interesting psychologically that it, it works once and and then we still we speak about Anna Cap, we speak about Mansfeld and the Cakewalk and all this. And it's it's um it's about like like in literature, um, it's it's um, the music does is abstract in a way, but also becomes very, a little bit programmatic. And I'm interested by the fact that, you know, sometimes we ex extract some of the preludes um, and just play, you know, pianists will play one or two of them. And so there are a couple which are particularly well known, um, for instance, but did Debussy compose them in the order in which they are? Um, in which they're presented. So did he start, you know, book one and then write, you know, one, two, three, et cetera, and then move over to book two? Or did he sort of create an architecture subsequently? And does he have a sort of plan before he starts composing? Or is it something which evolves organically? I don't know, Eloise. I think actually I uh, once experienced uh, to play just some of them, uh, but not in the uh, right order. And uh, if you play like five or six preludes, it can be also a nice way uh, to propose them to the public. And it doesn't have to be absolutely in the right order or, or play all of them at one time. I think it's quite flexible and uh, there are di very different pieces. And uh, there are some uh, very joyful, some very sarcastic, for example, uh, I really like the, the story of the General Lavigne. Uh, General Lavigne was an American clown who was uh, doing some shows in Paris in the, in the years 1910. And the story is that during his show, he was able to play piano with his toes. So that's why the mentem sounds so trivial and so funny. And um, I, really, I think it's, it's possible also to play them as an encore, as individual pieces, and it has also uh, interest like this. Yes, that's of often done as lollipops as the, um, as the expression um, goes, yes, as, en as encore pieces. Um, uh, but was Debussy himself, do we know, was he quite happy at sort of bits being played in different orders? Laura, you're nodding. Yes, I don't think there's any particular evidence to say that he meant for them always to be performed as a cycle. Um, I think they were fairly early on, but actually that was just one way of doing them. Like a lot of these cycles, actually, so far as the composers were concerned, there was an integrity there, but they could also be selected as, well, lollipops or postcards or just as individual miniatures. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and, and Daniel's right. Um, it's a marathon to play them all. So one can understand that selecting a few um, might, be, might be a good way of um, proceeding. Um, talking of, of cycles, I'd like to bring um, Anna um, in now to think also about Debussy um, as a composer of other uh, types of music, not just for the piano. And in particular, um, I'm interested in one of his song cycles, The Ariette Oubliés, because it sets poems by Paul Verlaine. Um, Berlaine, who was set to music by a number of um, French composers. Um, so, Anna, you, I think, have already sung the Ariette's Oubliers, is that right? 
Absolutely. I've kind of come, I started working on them actually when I was at Oxford and used them as part of my finals recital and have actually never really left them behind since. I really, I really love this cycle. And Valen was a poet who was central to Debussy throughout his career in terms of writing for voice. And um, particularly as he, I believe one of Debussy's early piano teachers was Madame Mouti, who was Verlaine's mother-in-law. And um, so he would have been aware of, uh, perhaps I'm speculating, he would have been aware of uh, Verlaine's, I suppose, turbulent life and, uh, and uh, some of that story. Um, so we start with uh, the, the Ariettes Oubliées are really, in a way I like the sense of, uh, someone used the word little postcards, they really are an exploration of something utterly different each time. We have this sense of a romantic strain that passes through many of them, but not, not necessarily. And each paints a completely different world. I'm thinking of Il Pleur de Mon Coeur, which is so evocative of water and um, that being linked to a, to a real heaviness of sentiment. And then coming through to Chevaux de Bois, which is utterly different and uh, begins in this um, vibrant, vivacious world of the merry-go-round. And we finish in this beautiful picture of twilight. But the way he writes um, kind of pairs both piano and voice, as we said before, as, uh, in collaboration to create these worlds. We play in Il Pleur de Mon Coeur, perhaps we play different roles, but really to create an overall picture. Laura, sorry, you wanted to come in. Oh, I was actually going to ask something, which was about how these work as duos and how you go about working as pianist and a singer together with them. Um, one of the things that always strikes me about this repertoire is actually the challenge of articulation and thinking about the difference between the, the keyboard and how that how readily that sounds versus say singing consonants and when they emerge and how you go about thinking about that in musical terms, particularly with these songs, if that makes any sense. So. Absolutely. One point that, that I would uh, like to stress is that um, Debussy's um, piano part is, is so difficult generally. And we don't have any longer music like Schubert, Mozart or, or Schumann or even Brahms. Most of it could be handled by, a, by an amateur or even the singers themselves. But I don't think uh, a singer would normally be able to, to get around the playing the piano part of it. It's, it's, it's really, it's a lot of things going on rhythmically, harmonically, and so many voices. It's really a, a, a complete universe and cosmos in the accompaniment. And the singing part is uh, in a way easier. It's less, less virtuoso, I, I think. But, but the words come, come across very beautifully. Anna, do you think the singing part is easier? <laughs> <laughs> well, as a singer who has limited piano capacity, I do normally like to try and work my way into a harmonic world of a composer by sitting at the piano and playing through some of the, perhaps some of the harmonic uh, movement rather than the whole piece. I would be hard pushed to do that with WC. I, th those are certainly challenging parts, but I think the joy of that for a singer is it really puts the onus on you to listen. Because I find with WC, it's not that I come with less of an idea of what I want, but it feels much more changeable based on who you're working with and that process of collaboration. Because the color that you get from the piano introduction of Selig Stas, for example, just feeds that first vocal line. You really, it, it's, it's so much a partnership, it's so much a collaboration. And I think in terms of um, your question, Laura, about uh, how we articulate then the text, um, generally uh, my thoughts about singing in French are it's very much a vowel to vowel, different from German or Russian, where I think consonants become more of the supported legato. Um, with French, the vowels are essential, but the way Debussy sets the consonants of um, Verlaine are, is quite extraordinary. So we have the caillou qui, qui roule in the, I think it's in the first, in, in Celestas, um, and enjoying being playful with those and uh, allowing a little spontaneity really in how you use that text it feels quite important to the style to me. Thank you. I was wondering about freedom, actually, and how much freedom you can take within this this music as interpreters. Um, it is obviously virtuosic and has its technical challenges. And then there's the issue of playing together, singing together. But it can sound 
as a listener as if it's fairly free, but my sense is that actually, no, it's quite tightly controlled. I would say that's probably right. I wouldn't want to, but Eloise and I haven't had the joy of working together yet. <laughs> Might be the case that I take a few too many liberties. I think, no, I think I joke. I think your sense of it being strict is also very true. I think there's minute um, spontaneity and freedom in the way we place the vocal line. But in terms, of, in terms of collaborating with a pianist, I know that the onus is on me for the vowel to be really well placed rhythmically so that what I'm doing is clear. But within that, finding the, finding the freedom of the text, I think is entirely possible um, and a real joy in the music. Do you agree that um, I think the, the freedom is written out, it's actually strictly written, but instead of writing a rubato, which he does sometimes, but he actually writes out the ritardando, the changing, and it's all very subtle dynamics, but everything is mostly written and it's not so much guesswork for the in interpreters. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think um, uh, very often in this uh, cycle, uh, the musical phrases, they really are flowing very naturally and they imitate in a very natural way, uh, very closely the spoken language. And we don't have too much to add so much to this. And uh, Debussy was really very gifted to, to translate the French language into music and it doesn't need so much, uh, uh, yeah, so much rubato. Yes. I think you, there was a, an interview with Dame Janet Baker recently about the role of a singer in general. And she talked about trying to become a pane of glass uh, in order to reflect the composer and the poet's intention. And I think never is that more true than with a composer like Debussy, because as, as Daniel and Eloise both ap said, absolutely, all the detail is there. It's on the score for you to take some benefit. And so these, these are melodies, there's a pianist and there's a singer. So it's quite an intimate formation. Um, are they written for intimate venues? I'm struck by what Daniel said when he said, you know, no amateur can play this in a sense. You know, anybody who knows a bit about the piano can sit down and, you know, bang out a Schubert lead, but they can't do that with Debussy. That's more or less what you said, Daniel. Um, so for... <laughs> I'm not betraying your words, clearly. Um, but so are these, are these written for small gatherings with professional musicians? Is there any sense that there might be some form of um, performance always when they're played? Or can you imagine them being played in, a sort of, in an intimate setting, just as a sort of duo? Are they written for specific events, occasions, etc.? I personally, I'm not... Uh historically informed enough to know what happened at that time, uh, how, how the concerts uh, were. But I, I think, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the tendency is, uh, and it has been on for a, for a long time, is listening to uh, leader recital, uh, melody, uh, poetry, to art song is, is not a very popular uh, thing. And um, uh, there is popular music. <laughs> For that and, and I, I, I suppose that Debussy was very much into art and the, the, the raffinement and the uh, and uh, totally into what uh, uh, what it was about and, and the uh, ideals and, and not necessarily making them popular although he could use popular images and popular music he could introduce them in, in, in his in his in his word. I, I think in Oxford, where we have the Leader Festival, with which um, Laura has been involved, you'll find that lots of um, there are lots of members of audiences uh, very, very happy to listen to um, Leader and melody very... and all forms of art song. But I think it's got a lot to do with scale of venue yeah. as well. I mean, if we're talking early 20th century, we're still talking in some ways the the salon concert, which doesn't mean tiny audiences. It can actually be quite ample audiences, but in quite a rarefied atmosphere. I suppose, and I suppose there is that sense of that potential with these songs that you're singing to people who who appreciate them, who are aficionados on some level. The other thing is that this cycle is dedicated to Mary Garden, who was Melisande, and so mm -hmm. that interaction between the operatic stage and obviously Debussy is doing something quite particular in opera, but that also feeds into what he's doing in song. So there's a lot of interaction between mm -hmm. opera and song. And I think that's also quite interesting in terms of what we think of drama and declamation. 
Uh, I think I agree with you. We can actually uh, already guess in this in this piece. Although he was only tw in his twenty when he composed it, but we can already guess the typical Debussy recitative style that is uh, we will find later in his uh, unique opera *Pierre et les And for example, if you take the last sentence of the first um, song *Selectaz*, I find it really quite astonishing to see how much he succeeds to express in one musical phrase so much uh, a mobility of the emotion. So in only one uh, musical sentence, he can express doubt, he can express exaltation, uh, tenderness, whispering, and it's really very quick to change, uh, to make the change in a, in a very short time, actually. I think that's absolutely right, especially in that song, because there in the in the in the beginning of Celestas, we have this kind of uh, beautiful sensuality. It feels incredibly warm, but also we have these uncertainties and these doubts. And and as a singer, you come from taking a line that's very uh, set in the middle voice, long, long and languorous, exactly a um, langoureuse. But by the end, in three pages of music, sometimes two, depending on the edition, we're up in a top A, feeling that anxiety and the vulnerability of exposing yourself to someone um, in that way of being so intimate with somebody. And so where we have this idea that, that the French music is less perhaps psychologically driven than the German, at the same time, it's very much a part of the picture. And so that brings me to um, a question, Anna. Um, there's a question for all of you. What is French about French music? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's the if we're talking about French music of this period, it's a, it's a it's a search for beauty. There's a sense of spontaneity. Um, at the same time, there's a real discipline to what the score gives you. Um, I would say that more than anything else. It's that search for beauty in, in whatever it is that our little postcard or our little world has created. And something that's more subtle, more um, spontane spontaneous. I would say it's very much at uh, that time avoiding what is German. Yes. <laughs> French music is not German, right. <laughs> Eloise, did you have anything more? <laughs> No, I think uh, in this cycle also what you can see is that um, it's always on two levels. You have the literal and you have the metaphorical level. Mm -hmm. And for example, if you take the second um, second piece, he's really uh, describing the, the sound of the rain, uh, imitating the sound with a piano accompaniment, which is very monotone, very light, never ending, exactly like the sound of rain. But this is also the rain in the heart of the poet. And I think this kind of two levels, literal and metaphorical, are quite uh, typical also for, for this kind of period in song cycle. Hmm. Well, Laura, you I, wanted I, to I, add my, something. Sorry, just in my remark, uh, 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 it, it's, it's also about the deconstruction. It's, it's not showing off, showing off uh, the, the, the structure of a piece. And it's uh, les gommes, actually. It's just, uh, and it's uh, really the content and the psychological uh, and the colors and, and everything. It's, it's just, uh, it's not about French food, but really about uh, uh, the parfum and, uh, and so many, many things. Uh, but uh, I think one really important part is that it's, it's not about structuring. I would totally agree. And I think that you used the crucial word there, Daniel, which is color. I think the color in this music and the range of color achieved by these composers is quite astonishing. But I would add, I would agree with all you say, but I would also add to that, that some of that color comes from what Daniel and Eloise have already mentioned, which is there's bits of Wagner, there's bits of Java, there's Russian music. And like all musical styles, actually saying it's one nationality doesn't really make any sense, at least not to me. Mm. And I've got another question about a word which you used right at the beginning, Daniel, um, impressionism, musical impressionism. Can you say a few words about what musical impressionism is, in a sense, and why you use that word about Debussy? Well, I, it's already, has already been said, timbre, there's the colors, and, uh, and really how we perceive. I, this, is a, this is a very delicate su uh, subject because uh, Debussy was not happy with um, people saying that his music was impressionist. <laughs> 
although he's the foremost uh, representative of it. Uh, so, so this could be open for debate. Uh, but uh, um, and then there are a lot of technical features using special uh, keys and special uh, the whole tones keys and the combination of sounds and uh, and as I said it already the not showing a, st a structure but or uh, sort of hiding it in a way. Do you agree with that, Eloise? Yeah, totally. I think it's also uh, on a technical level the harmonics. The, I mean, the chords that used to be 200 years ago or 100 years uh, sooner, very um, source of tension. They don't need anymore to be resolved uh, in a logical way and they don't have the same function. And I think Debussy is really the composer, composer in excellence that really use harmony uh, as colors, exactly like a painter will do and not as function. And that's very new also, uh, yes. So you think the analogy with um, Impressionism, which we think of first and foremost as a school of painting um, in that respect is a, is a fair one. Um, and Total. as a singer, sorry. Total and, as a fair, sing yeah. Yeah. and as a singer, Anna, um, does that strike you also as a? Absolutely. Yep. I think this, I, I was doing a little reading before today and, and Taraskin was talking about um, Debussy's use of harmony. He described it almost as painterly because we don't have that forward thrust. We, as Eloise, I think said, the, the, the harmony doesn't need to resolve in the same way. And I think that gives us a lot of the, the impressionistic color. And do you find that um, that is true in works which have collaborations between um, say voice and piano, as well as in, for instance, um, orchestral works or as in works purely for piano is, is the same thing happening or is the fact of having the sort of collaboration of, of, of say two as it were voices the piano and the and the human voice um, affecting something different or differently? I think there is a huge amount of exchange between voice and piano in the way I was thinking about Il Pardon Mon Coeur just because uh, Eloise was mentioning that before and the way Debussy writes to pass between voice and piano I think is quite quite unique and and affects that kind of journey through the piece rather than necessarily feeling the drive underneath it in quite the same way. And I was interested, sorry, Daniel, please yeah, come in. Well, sure, surely the, um, uh, uh, in orchestra works, it's the sound very impressionistic as, as well. The piano suits uh, wonderfully for all these watery colors and the, the brouillard and, and the mist and, and with, the, with the pedal effects, it's, it's really very suitable. And, and maybe for just for, a, I don't, I don't want to, uh, to be um, not fair, but, but the singing voice, it's, 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 it's how, do you, how do you make your voice sound impressionist? Is, is it possible? I think for me, it becomes about color. It becomes about hearing the, hearing the color of the piano or the orchestra and, and being collaborating with that, being informed by that and giving back to that as well and not feeling there's something, there is something freer about it or more spontaneous, which I do associate with impressionism. I agree that you can't, perhaps the means of creating color for the, for the voice is different and we have the text to deal with, but I think you can be inspired by that, by, the, by, by pianistic color and by that spontaneity. And I'm also interested, um, coming back to something you said earlier about using the vowels and questions of liquidity also maybe in the way you, you, you formulate um, the words. And in um, Eloise's parallel with um, Bélias et Mélisande, one thing mm -hmm. which struck me thinking of um, Debussy and Lili Boulanger together, of course, is how important Materlinck is to both of them, the great Belgian symbolist Materlinck. And again, I mean, that's another analogy. Um, for those of us who are not professional musicians, we sort of try and, and, and think through parallels. So impressionism, you know, is, is a useful tool for people like me, or indeed symbolism. I mean, there's, there, there are some times when, um, when, when symbolism is, is uh, mentioned too. Um, but nature is often used also to talk about um, Debussy. And I'm struck by the fact that there are so many different terms, which, you know, when you take one of them, we've just taken Impressionism, but we could have taken nature, we could have taken symbolism, and we'd have found ways to make them work. Um, and I think uh, that, in a sense, pays tribute to, to how extraordinary a composer he is, how extraordinarily challenging um, a composer he is in many ways, um, and how, how varied a composer he, he, he is. You know, I'm, I'm struck when I listen to Debussy, um, 
I think Luis used the term modern um, at one stage. He is extraordinarily modern sometimes. Yeah. Mm. And, and we can hardly imagine, I mean, to give you an idea, when Debussy's first opera, Pelas and Melisande, was premiere in 1902 at the Opera Comic in Paris, I mean, the scandal it created was actually really comparable to the scandals that happened during the premiere of uh, uh, Igor Stravinsky, uh, Rite of the Spring in uh, 1913 at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. And the audience uh, was so shocked and so divide, uh, divide. And actually until today, today, still today, this opera is quite controversial. And some people are totally enthusiastic about it and some other people just extremely negative and critical so we see that uh, the modernity is, of Debussy is still actual actually. Well I'll admit to being an enthusiast. I, I <laughs> yes, don't know about right. anybody else here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'd like maybe um, to have a final uh, question um, to bring Debussy and uh, Lili Boulanger back together since we, we brought them together. And that is simply, um, we've done this because um, we, we thought it was a, a good way of speaking of two composers um, who, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, died within a few days of each other. Do you think that women composers are being given um, the place they deserve uh, in performances currently? And is this something which is changing uh, or not? Not I yet. Think, yeah, sorry. I, I don't, I don't, not yet. I think there are uh, many wonderful uh, female composers from 19th century to discover. And uh, I've seen some and uh, there's some secret projects coming of the rediscovering and really wonderful. And, and of course our society is changing to the better. So uh, give, in in give, terms of equity, and uh, we have, of course, had Clara Schumann and, uh, and uh, uh, Norwegian Agathe Bakker Gröndal and uh, Germaine Taifer and Mel Bonis and, and so many others. But uh, society is changing, and, and I, I, hope, I hope that we will be performing more. Eloise? Yeah, I think actually it's only a matter of time because uh, it's a little bit comparable as the problematic of uh, women conductors. I mean, there are more, men, more and more women who are filling the classes and study composition, study conducting. And I think in a few decades, uh, there is no reason why uh, contemporary women composers uh, or uh, women conductors shouldn't be as present as men on stage and in the concert programs. I mean, personally, I'm quite optimistic about it. That's great. Anna? I share in Louise's optimism. I think so much of it is about the problems that we faced in the past have been about education and obviously a lack of opportunity. And I think as we see that start to change, hopefully the language around female composers can change as well. At the moment, they are in the minority. And so it's exceptional when we, when we include them in a program and we highlight them as such. But I think with time, it won't be necessary anymore. And, and Laura, would you like a final word on this? Yeah, I'm also hopeful. I mean, I think this is an age of advocacy in terms of raising knowledge, awareness and knowledge of female composers. I mean, I hope we get to a stage before too long where actually saying woman composer is not something that we feel we have to do. Mm. I, I, I would agree uh, with that, Laura. And we decided that the best way, in a sense, to advocate for um, a woman composer, the woman composer about whom we have been speaking today, was actually to listen to some of her music. And I'd like, uh, before I end, simply uh, to extend my thanks, obviously, um, to the three people we've been listening to today as guests, Anna Sidris, Eloise Belacun, and Danielle Proper, to Laura Tunbridge also, and of course to all the team at Torch, um, in particular to um, Wes, Nikki, Amber, and Holly. And we're going to say to you that this is not um, a farewell, it's an au revoir, because we very much hope to bring um, Anna, Eloise and Danielle back with Philippe Cantor for a series of concerts once um, COVID allows us to do this. So this is just the start uh, of a process. And with thanks to Anna who magically recorded this in lockdown um, and to her partner in crime for this, um, Dylan Perez, we're going to play you out with the very poem which a number of you have translated Elle était descendue by Francis Jam, set to music by Lily Boulanger. Thank you very much. <laughs>